Hello. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's installment of the 2024 January series. My name is Samantha Karecki, and I'm a senior here at Calvin from Grand Haven, Michigan, studying strategic communication. Would you all please take a moment to silence your cell phones? As you are doing so, I would like to welcome guests at all of our remote viewing locations, including Hudsonville, Michigan, Tucson, Arizona, Grays Lake, Illinois, and Sioux Center, Iowa, and all our virtual attendees across time zones. We are thankful you are joining us today. And now, would you please join me in a moment of prayer? Dear Lord, thank you for bringing all of us here today to get, <laughs> thank you for bringing all of us together today to engage in our intellectual curiosities. We know you are present in this room as we listen to our guest, just as we know you have been present with her in her preparations for today. We are here to glorify you. Please open our minds and our hearts to deeper levels of thinking and connection with each other this afternoon. In your name we pray, amen. And now, Dr. Garth Pauly, Professor of Communication, will introduce our guest. I recently asked a colleague at Westmont College to describe today's speaker in one word. And the word that she chose was fantastic. And it's easy to understand why. Felicia Wu Song is a fantastic teacher. Indeed, in her first year as a professor of sociology at Westmont, she received the Bruce and Adeline Bear Outstanding Teaching Award for the Social Sciences. Felicia is a fantastic scholar as well. One reviewer described her most recent book, Restless Devices, as, quote, a powerful work of spiritual formation to all who seek to live humanely and faithfully in our digital age. In her excellent book, Dr. Wu Song explores how digital communication and information technologies function as forms of life, to borrow a term from the scholar Langdon Winner. She examines how our technological devices form us, how they structure our lives and shape the contours of human being. She challenges readers, and I expect she'll challenge us today, to reorient our lives. Felicia envisions the good life in a technological society as one in which we're formed by God rather than left to our own devices. I hope you're eager to hear her words of wisdom and eager to hear her challenge for us today. Uh, please note that Felicia will be available to greet you all in the west lobby of the Fine Arts Center following her presentation. And finally, just one quick note, Calvin University is grateful to the Howard Miller Company for underwriting today's presentation. So now would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Felicia Wu Song. It is truly an honor and genuine pleasure to be with all of you and be a part of the January series um, and have this chance to address you all on this topic of digital technologies and personhood. I'm just going to get myself a little sorted out here. So I'm an Anglican with a Southern Baptist upbringing. Chew on that for a little bit. So um, I like to therefore begin with a bit of testimony and confession, drawing on my two faith traditions. So um, here's the testimony part. Um, 13 years ago, I converted. I invited the iPhone 4, known to diehard Apple fans as the Jesus phone into my life. And I took this leap of faith and accepted the Jesus phone because I believed. I believed in its promise to improve my life, make managing my work and family life more easy. And since then, I have texted, I have posted, I have played Candy Crush. I have streamed countless podcasts, videos, spent years carefully curating my favorite music stations on the ancient dinosaur of Pandora. I am genuinely grateful for how much my digital devices help me fashion a life that is more convenient, more efficient, and even pleasurable. But just as I've known that Jesus transforms anyone who opens themselves up to his presence, 
I personally can testify to the curious ways in which the Jesus phone has transformed the patterns of my daily life and penetrated the habits and occupations of my mind and heart. So here I move into the spirit of confession. I have to admit, the influence of the Jesus phone on my life hasn't always been great. I don't like that I'm chronically vexed by my email inbox that fills like a reverse form of, like a form of reverse quicksand. I'm not proud of the fact that I can be sitting in a meeting or having coffee with a friend, but my spirit is distracted. My presence is uncommitted because a part of me is actually reaching for cyberspace, wondering if someone has replied to an earlier message or post. And I'm troubled by all of this. And yet, despite these misgivings, what continues to fascinate me is how it all has come to feel so remarkably normal. Being on our devices, swiping, tapping, scrolling away, it all has the look and feel of what it means to be connected, to belong, to be responsible, to be successful, and frankly, to be modern, cool, and relevant. And here's where I find philosopher Charles Taylor helpful. When he explains that every age is defined by what he calls a social imaginary. Taylor writes that a social imaginary incorporates a sense of the normal expectations we have of each other, the kind of common understanding that enables us to carry out the collective practices that make up our social life. So if that language is a little too dense for some of us that may not have had enough sleep last night, like me, uh, I'll put it in regular words. Um, a social imaginary is a kind of story. It's a story that a culture tells itself about what we believe to be our human condition and how we ought to live life together. So to the extent that a digital life can feel remarkably normal, we can understand it to be training us into a distinctive story, a social imaginary that feels desirable, feels compelling, that is until we encounter a startlingly different social imaginary. So consider the one that's embedded in Tish Harrison Warren's description of confession in Anglican practice. It's a bit of a long quote, so um, I'll have it up on the screen um, and just follow along if that helps. Uh, so she writes this. In church each week we repent together. Confession reminds us our failures or successes in the Christian life are not what define us or determine our worth before God or God's people. Instead, we are defined by Christ's life and work on our behalf. We kneel, we confess and repent, and then what a wonder, the word of absolution, Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. And then she goes on, when we confess and receive absolution together, we're reminded that none of our pathologies, neuroses, or sins, no matter how small or secret, affect only us. We are a church, a community, a family. We are not simply individuals with our pet sins and private brokenness. If we are saved, we are saved together as the body of Christ as a church. Because of this, I need to hear my forgiveness proclaimed to remind me that though my sin is worse than I care to admit, I'm still welcome here. I'm still called into this community and loved. So when we have been deeply immersed in the currents of our digital world and its social imaginary, Running across such an account of Christian confession and the church is to come against something that feels positively alien. Warren's description brings into sharp relief 
the vast distance between the posture we practice when we are steeped in the social imaginary of our digital ecology and the posture that Christian spirituality encourages. Our normalized digital practices of keeping up, grasping for attention, seeking the rewards of affirmation can feel paltry and even thin against the sheer magnificence of what is promised in the ritual of confession and absolution. To be invited to freely admit our failures and discover that we are still loved and welcomed, this is unheard of in social media. So the pathos of our cultural moment is this. Despite what followers of Christ may profess in our faith, most of us are so desperately trying to keep up with the demands of our digitally saturated lives that we simply lose track of who or where we even are. We lose track of the fact that the Christian tradition produces a social imaginary that understands our embodiment, our worth, our relationship to time, the other, in terms that are completely opposite from the story we are trained in when enmeshed within social media and all of our productivity apps. And we end up living lives that express a story that doesn't quite match up with the theological and faith commitments that we profess to be true. So what I want to do today is first describe the story or the social imaginary that the digital world is training us into then consider why it is that we choose to live into that story. And then explore how viewing digital practice as a form of liturgy can help us begin to reimagine our contemporary soul formation. So first, what is the story we are being trained into in this digital landscape? One of the key features of the social imaginary is the normalized expectation that we live in what media scholars call permanent connectivity. When you look at the history of mass communication and telecommunications, the promise of connection has always been there from the start. The telegraph, radio, TV, at the core of the internet, in all of its amazing networking capacity, is this desire to connect, to, sh to share. But we all know that, quote, being connected in 2024 means something dramatically different from what it meant back when the internet of yesteryear was accessed through this huge boxy desktop computer that was dialed into the wall of our homes and our workplaces. And remember that awful noise, those of us that were old enough to remember this, right? That we pause and then made this, I won't try to imitate it, noise, right? Being connected was a discrete behavior, right? You dialed in. Now being connected is closer to a state of consciousness. It's a human condition. Permanent connectivity no longer exists in the realm of action. It is now a state of being. A key facet of this permanent connectivity is the fact that our technology is mobile and therefore ubiquitous. Today, we carry it in our pockets, in our bags, it's strapped to our wrist, so that they seem to be living and breathing alongside us as we move throughout the day. A study a couple years ago showed that 30% of Americans, 18 to 54, say they are almost constantly online. As you see, that percentage is much higher amongst the 18 to 29. 10 years ago, a study on families found that 68% of parents and 78% of teens check their devices at least hourly. One can only imagine how 10 years later, especially post-pandemic, how this has likely even increased. And so this permanent connectivity right, is with us all the time. But what makes it compelling is the fact that our technology is social meaning it is embodied in our responsibilities and in our community. So I don't mean it in just, oh, it helps me talk to my friends, social, but it is embedded in the regular social realities. And it's a wonderful thing in many ways, right? To have our technologies help us stay connected with our family and friends, school and work, but it also means that we become increasingly dependent on our devices to conduct our family lives, our friendships, our loved ones' schooling, 
our work lives, and all the social expectations and obligations that characterize those areas of our lives often translate into being always available and immediately responsive to any text or email. We've come to feel that being on our devices is necessary to being a good parent, a good friend, a good colleague, a good employee, a good leader. And finally, layer on the fact that our current digital media and services deliver content that is infinitely novel. There's always a new post, there's always a new video, there's always messages to check. And then we mix these three things together and we get this psychological cocktail of pleasures and anxieties and felt expectations. And even when our devices are not in view or on our bodies, our consciousness has become sufficiently trained and thoroughly immersed in the habits of being formed by an unceasing awareness of how, as Dalton Conley has described, life is constantly being lived elsewhere. Being in permanent connectivity means that our bodies are in one place, but our minds and our consciousness dwell on the stuff of our screens, ever aware that something else is always happening, something probably more important than whatever I'm doing right now. And that's why we feel the itch to peek and find out. Now, one thing that trains us in permanent connectivity's state of consciousness is certainly just the sheer amount of time that we spend looking at our screens. Uh, in 2019, the average American child age 8 to 12 was engaged in non-school-related screen time almost five hours a day. This screen time increased for teenagers, sorry, to about seven and a half hours a day, which is almost half of their waking hours. And lest we think that digital issues is a young person's problem, parents and older generations are spending just as much time, if not more. Uh, before the pandemic, American parents uh, had 56% of them admitting to being on social media too much, and 68% admitting that at least sometimes they're distracted by their phones when spending time with their children. So, while we may vex about these sheer numbers of hours, it's interesting to note that we actually have little or no awareness of what we are doing during a significant portion of our screen time. It's not like we're just sitting down and banging out seven and a half hours, right? One study shows that our time spent online goes by largely unnoticed, little reflection, right? Because it's just an accumulation of micro moments throughout the day, in between meetings, waiting online, right? Waiting for the hot water to come on. And the digital practices that characterize our lives are habitual, largely automatic, even compulsive. So what is going on with us? Why are we so deeply immersed in rhythms that we may recognize as veering on addictive, or at the very least, acknowledge that we are not necessarily living our best lives? So in her 1958 book, The Human Condition, Hannah Arendt noted that a reporter characterized the first successful satellite launch as a first quote, step towards escape from men's imprisonment to the earth. And Arendt saw this milestone as one in a long line of technologies driven by a wish to escape the human condition. And Arendt's observation compels me to ask, perhaps we're compulsively driven to be permanently connected because it's part of our wish to escape the human condition. Maybe that explains why we wrap ourselves in digital blankets of unending news updates to keep ourselves warm with the comfort of knowledge or seeking to calm our fears or increase the reach of our control. Maybe that explains why we run to the carnival of social media, streaming, entertainment, and online retail, seeking to reduce the distance we feel from each other and seeking new solutions to the age-old problems of loneliness and alienation that philosophers, artists, and theologians have long pondered through the ages. 
Indeed, often it seems we run into the beckoning arms of our digital technologies because we feel that the permanent connectivity will dull the pain. As Pascal once remarked, being unable to cure death, wretchedness, and ignorance, we have decided in order to be happy not to think about such things. I don't know about you, but for me, to think that Pascal, living in the 17th century, had observed our instinct to run away from the helplessness, helplessness of being human is strangely comforting. We aren't the only ones who have had to struggle against the problems of misery and brutality. What's different today, however, is that our digital ecology is disturbingly effective at helping us not to think about such things. The digital realm offers us what Jean Baudrillard termed the hyper-real, an enhanced version of reality, a tricked out, glamorous, alluring, filtered version of reality that is almost impossible to ignore. Employing lead edge insights of behavioral psychology and brain science, many of you know now, right? There's these finely calibrated algorithms that calculate the optimal way to keep us tethered to their sites. Digital media industries have sought to colonize our attention and unabashedly search for new and efficient ways of monetizing our most basic needs for relationship and belonging. The same experts that design casinos and other addictive industries are brought in to consult about what types of notifications, what color buttons and badges, what types of emotional content they ought to throw at us, right, to train our brains to become activated and hooked on dopamine. And these platforms understand us. They know that we like things that are sexy, funny, and violent. And they know that when we're tired, we have little willpower to resist the autoplay of the next video that will start in less than four seconds. With such vast systems of persuasion in place, it is no wonder that we feel compelled to turn to our screens whenever being human is just too much to bear. And as such, perhaps the digital social imaginary is actually leading us to become a people who are living on the run. We tell ourselves that we are running in order to keep up, but I believe very often, too often, we are running from the pain of being human. And as a counterpoint, I'd like to suggest that the Christian story, the Christian social imaginary, unlike what many presume, is not a story that offers a formula of escape, in exchange for good works or sacrifice. It's actually a story that promises the presence of divine love found in the creator and sustainer of the universe who is with us when it feels like there's no way out, but only through. And the key evidence of this is found in the incarnation of Jesus, where we find the God of the universe consenting to experience the indignities of the human condition, all the frustrations of poverty, ethnic marginalization, political oppression, unjust humiliation and death, ultimately undoing their power through his resurrection life. At the heart of the Christian social imaginary then is the steadfast promise that God's very presence with us is what gives people hope and empowers them to go through all that being human can mean. And yet, many Christians would count themselves among the growing percentage of Americans who are almost constantly connected to a digital landscape that urges us to perform, to hide our weaknesses, to compete against each other for attention. And while the first century disciples were called to abide in Jesus, as he promised to abide in them, Modern day followers of Jesus are actually spending a lot of their consciousness training to abide in the digital, and not surprisingly, we may awaken to find that it is the digital rather than the Christ that abides in us. And while this may be a rather bleak condition or conclusion to have reached, and while we may recognize the compulsive checking of our devices is an impoverished form of abiding, people of faith might actually have something to learn from these digital-oriented impulses of ours. For if we can recognize how deeply we have cultivated a heart of expectancy toward all things digital, then we might be able to begin pursuing a life where we use those same muscles and direct them towards the divine rather than the digital. So here's how I see it. 
When we live in this digital age, many of us live our lives peeking at our devices. We're in a state of waiting, anticipating, sensing that there's something out there asking for our attention, that someone's going to send us a word. Someone, anyone, we don't care, right? Just through our devices, something. And whether we wait in fear or missing out, whether we wait in a state of dull hunger, seeking to be stimulated or to escape, we go through our days accustomed to having our bodies in one place but our minds elsewhere and engaged in a digital imagination about the thrills and worries of work and school and friends or family perpetually developing in the digital realm. And I like to think of our hearts as being attuned, like one of Jane Austen's disadvantaged maidens waiting in the parlor for the suitor to visit, waiting desperately. And then when a notification pings, it's as if we hear the digital footsteps coming and approaching, and rather than having our desperation bridled by a Victorian code of decorum, we reflexively leap with our fingers to tap on our screens to devour anything that's coming through the door. It doesn't matter. And indeed, what we have discovered in our digital age is that we do have a remarkable endurance and capacity to remain in tune with our devices. It's the first thing we greet in the morning. It's the last thing we take with us into bed. In between meetings and activities at any given pause, we diligently tend to our devices. And it's always on our minds and our hearts. Why? Because we are waiting and searching for joy and satisfaction, for purpose, for love. We are waiting and therefore abiding in the digital. So, what if we were to cultivate such a heart of expectancy for God's desire to speak to us and commune with us? What if we were to grow in our habits and routines to stretch out our antenna towards checking in with God as much as I am always checking in on my phone? What if the church was an institution that equipped people to grow in this countervailing orientation that directs our hearts of expectation towards God as a source of joy and satisfaction, purpose, and love? The life source of comfort, fulfillment, and belonging rather than our screens. I ask these questions wholly recognizing that the reality of our digital age is not something we can easily extract ourselves from. Most of us can't just stop doing email or throw out our phones. It would be quite relationally costly if we just walked away from social media. So what can we do to get realigned to the Christian social imaginary that is found in the person and ministry of Jesus Christ? What type of spiritual formation needs to happen? So one paradigm I found particularly helpful is viewing digital practice as a form of liturgy. In philosopher Jamie Smith's book, You Are What You Love, he draws from an Augustinian understanding of Christian formation and bodily practice and suggests that rather than viewing human beings as thinkers we are who are primarily formed by knowledge or belief, we should better appreciate how we are, quote, desiring creatures primarily driven by our appetites and what we do with our bodies. If, in fact, we can recognize ourselves to be desiring creatures formed by the visceral and bodily, then we might re-see how our seemingly mundane routines function to train us towards some goal, some end, some telos, some vision of the good life. So in all of our digital practices of checking email and messages, reading our social media feeds when we first wake up, right before we go to bed, our desires and our souls are being formed. We're being trained towards becoming some kind of person. And so when we are unreflectively adopting the taken-for-granted norms of our digital ecology, we will find ourselves engaging in what Smith calls secular liturgies, these habits that we routinely practice with our bodies which have the effect of misforming our desires and our loves. According to Smith, he writes, secular liturgies capture our hearts by capturing our imaginations and draw us into ritual practice that teach us to love something very different from the kingdom of God. Therefore, to awaken ourselves to how our bodily routines both signal and shape our loves, 
and who we are becoming, we can ask something like this. Where in my daily life are there secular liturgies that are erecting blinders and obstacles to my recognizing when God is present or speaking? How do my digital secular liturgies train me to devalue what is proximate to me, what's happening all around me all the time? Have I missed opportunities to encounter the Christ in the, sp the quiet of my spirit or the holy presence of an unexpected guest? And after identifying our secular liturgies, Smith recommends that we develop counter liturgies that push back against this misformation of the heart. Instead of just removing the bad, so to speak, I love this concept of counter liturgies, right? That we, we need to fill ourselves with something good. Why? The Augustinian answer, because our hearts are restless and will remain so until we find our rest in God. And so in response to our digital secular liturgies, we should ask, okay, so how can I disrupt these digital habits and open myself up to the opportunity to taste some other way of living? Can I seek out some generative approach to developing practices and routines that redirect my loves back to experiencing communion with God and others in my life? So where can we go for these counter liturgies? Where are the sources? One obvious place might be to look to our Christian heritage of spiritual disciplines. The, the disciplines of, of silence, solitude, fasting, prayer, Lexio Divina, right? All of these all can be seen anew as counter liturgies that seek to push back against the subtle but very real misformations of our heart when our lives are so perpetually trained in the dictates of the digital. Another approach to counter liturgies, if this might seem too um, advanced, because uh, we feel like we're not that spiritual, um, and that's fine, right? Um, another approach might be to think of counter liturgies as uh, we, we might approach them by taking on experiments. Um, that is, trying to create circumstances for yourself that encourage you to step out of your comfort zone, help reveal your dependence on the digital, maybe develop a taste for something new that might seem kind of uncomfortable at first, but maybe actually become a precious source of life and vitality. So I'm just gonna walk us through two possible experiments. Um, and I've tried these myself, so I'm like the mad scientist. I always try it on myself before I recommend it to anyone else. Um, one thing I've tried um, to address the secular liturgy of using my technologies to multitask and think that I can do all things all at once um, is instead of multitasking, I try monotasking. What would happen if I just did one thing and just one thing? So when I'm driving, um, and this you should only do if you're alone. If someone's with you, you should probably talk to them. But if you're just driving and you're on your own, what would it be like to just drive? No phones, conversations, no podcasts, no music. Um, what would we notice? What might we feel in our bodies that we normally might not? Um, we could try just eating. This one's very challenging. When we're, again, when we're alone, right? Uh, what would it look like to just eat and not read, right, and do other things? Um, and then for the very super elite among us, uh, monotasking when you're at the airport, uh, what would it look like to just wait? <laughs> and really just wait. See, it was really just, that's for the elite, okay? Don't try that. Don't have that be the first thing. You gotta incrementally move yourself there. Right, so the idea is what would it, what, you know, monotasking is it's just what, what would happen to me, right? I'm so used to multitasking. What would happen to me if I just did one thing and I just experienced that thing? Would I experience God's presence in a different way? Would I experience my thoughts and my body in a different way? Um, a second experiment is uh, to try to counter the ways in which the digital is ubiquitous, that is always everywhere in my life. And so I might think about an experiment where I try to protect certain sacred spaces or certain sacred times for the purpose of rest or communion 
right? So what if I had a certain time of the day, morning, night, right? That was just, you know, we're just talking 15 minutes, you know? I'm not, again, not looking for something really ambitious, right? That I just say, oh, I'm putting all my devices away, right? And I'm just 15 minutes of quiet, right? Or just being with my loved one. Um, and then you can work your way up, right? Or is there a place in your home or your room that is a sacred place that is tech-free, right? Where you, every time you go there, it could be under a tree, right? Probably not right now when it, there's snow and wetness, right? When it's nicer, right? There's a tree that you just go to and it's always tech-free, right? Um, and it becomes a sacred place where maybe you hear the voice of God. Um, so, the idea of these experiments is, is, is not to experience um, success, actually. Um, it's not a measure of failure or success. Rather, experiments are all about gathering information, gathering data, learning about ourselves. And they are all potential counter-liturgies that might prove to give us new life and a refreshing taste of something new that we may choose to integrate into our daily routine. And, and should we struggle, maybe some of us try the 15 minutes or the monotasking and we're just breaking out in a cold sweat and we're like, this is not good for me. I don't know if I can do this, right? Instead of feeling like a failure, right? We could be curious, actually, and, and ask ourselves, why, why is this so hard for me? Um, and we could actually bring it into our prayer life, right? And ask, what, what is this, Lord, right? What, what, what do I need to be tending to now? So to close, um, I think it's worth dwelling on the fact that the word liturgy in Greek means the work of the people. And this meaning brings out the way that certain practices are not truly individual in nature, but are actually the product of the people, that is many people, a community, a culture. And when we think about social media and so many of our digital practices, they certainly exercise their power over us and remain sustainable precisely because they are practiced as a people, as a group, right? A lot of us wouldn't be on social media if everybody else wasn't there, right? We wouldn't care to be there. So if secular liturgies are practices that possess power because we engage in them together, then maybe what we need to be thinking about is how we can engage in bodily counter liturgies together. Right? Well, personal acts of technological self-discipline or some experiments I think are, are worth trying and, and are essential in our lives. I believe it's also ultimately the communal effort in, cult, in counter liturgies, the work of the people that will prove effective and sustainable. So we are clearly a people living in an age that is restless and hungry for something we can't put our finger on. And at such a critical moment when people in our society are searching, actually, for something different from the status quo, right? People are tired of their digital craziness. The church has an opportunity to proclaim a refreshing gospel vision of what it means to be human and demonstrate the richness that in fact lies in Christian theology, heritage, and praxis. And so if secular liturgies are in fact possessing the power, right, that is over us, the church can really dig into the truth of our theology and spirituality and lean into developing these counter liturgies that can help us navigate the challenges of our contemporary lives and offer a genuinely good news to our web-weary world. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Karen Sapi. You can send questions to askjseries at calvin.edu, and I will scroll incessantly, which I don't do in real life. Um, thank you. Never. I don't take my, I, I, I don't know where my cell phone is usually, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not one of us. Um, you, I, I want to say, you had sort of a harrowing journey getting here with lots of flights, delays, and misconnections. And so our students didn't get to meet with her this morning and instead spent half an hour sort of lamenting their dependence on technology. <laughs> um, 
and expressing the need to, yes, be constantly checking in case something happens between classes that we need to know about. Yeah. Um, but it led me to think about, they also talked about the different kinds of social media that are employed, even through this institution. I'm wondering, as you were talking about how the church can cultivate sort of counter liturgies, um, what could Calvin be doing <laughs> to cultivate a healthier relationship with technology? You're going to have that be the first question? Yeah, as I want to make guest. everybody happy. You, <laughs> um, you know, I think when organizations use social media um, as a form of broadcasting information, um, it is really tricky, right? Um, because it's efficient. It gets the job done. It's where people are. I get it, right? It makes a lot of sense. I think it does require taking several steps back to remember where that message is going into for each individual, student, faculty, staff, community member, and, and um, how it is affecting their larger life, right? It is it's just one more piece, right, of message, post that we need to keep up with. And, and so in that sense, um, you know, anyone that's been doing strategic communication, marketing knows, right? It's, it's all about breaking through the clutter, right? It's just a, a right. deluge of information. And so I think one of the things I often think about, um, especially for organizations that, that are considering how can we use technology differently is, is to think about two things. One, how can we be using our communications digitally in a way that is always aiming towards bringing people actually together, right? So if it's coordinating or moving people or if people are distributed in different states, right? How is it, like, is there a larger strategy of we are trying to move people into, a play, into the same room because we know that, that being in the same room will generate something qualitatively different? Right? That embodiment um, is a fundamentally different experience um, for all of us as human beings. Um, and then the second thing I think is, um, I think we still have a long way to go on thinking super creatively. Like we were kind of like just following what's been done. <laughs> and, and I think people are tired. Right? Like, I know my students don't read any email, well, my students at Westmont, right? I mean, we, you know, I barely can keep up with my emails, right? right? So then it's a matter of like, what can we be doing differently um, to try to reach people? Um, maybe there are old technologies um, that actually um, we renew and we come you mean back like to. Like posters? Like posters, like picking up the phone, like, <laughs> right? And I know there are like super interesting environmental, like, puzzles to work through, you know, like printing things on paper, right? Like that's, you know, that's, there's a downside too. I understand it's, it's very perplexing, but as organizations, if we can actually give ourselves just a little space to step back and say, what could we be doing differently? Um, what, and, and go back to what exactly are our goals here? <laughs> um, and, and where do we hope our people um, can, what kinds of lives can, do we hope our people can inhabit, right? Um, and then work our way back up, that would be a super interesting conversation. Good, good. I am. Um, I like the idea of digital Sabbaths or digital detoxes. Um, and I, I, try, I check email once on Sundays when I'm teaching in case students need me before Monday, but I really do try to stay offline one day a week. That helps me. Um, students said they couldn't do that because they have online assignments due. Mm -hmm. They rarely have them due, I think, on Sunday nights. So uh, I, I pushed back and said, you know, you <laughs> can manage your time. But, um, but I, a questioner here wants to know, how much time do you spend on your phone? What are your phone habits? Ooh, oh, you all are killing me today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's worse. <laughs> oh, no. Well, so I'll be the first to say, um, I, I do not keep a digital Sabbath, and it's not a principled thing at all. I mean, I'm a mess. I am, I'll, I'm with the weakest of the weak here. Um, and so um, my, 
My tech life has ebbed and flowed. There have been seasons when I've been much more disciplined. Um, and then there are seasons when I'm just kind of helter-skelter and I'm just trying to meet the demands of the day. Um, and, and I feel the drivenness, the tyranny of the tech, right? Um, what I do do is, what I am committed to is um, half an hour in the morning when I wake up, no tech. Um, I need that half an hour to not look at everything that's going to come flying in. And then at night, it's all about that protecting sacred spaces, protecting sacred times. Um, at night, um, at a certain time, it's done, right? Um, and in our house, all the phones and devices get charged over there on the other side of the house where the weakest of the week would have to climb out of bed, go down the hall, go into the room, turn on the lights to find where the charter is, right? We make it very hard, right? <laughs> and I'm the weakest of the week too. So I've done that, I've done it before, but it just create little obstacles for myself mm -hmm. that just say, no, it's not worth it. It'll just, it'll be fine, right? Um, and so I hope that um, I don't disappoint by not being a model of technological virtue. <laughs> you just acknowledge but, it, it's harder than but, it sounds. But it is, I mean, I think it's just, it's very difficult. And I, you know, like I have kids, teenagers, and that's part of the conversation too, is like, hey, it's really hard for me, right? Uh, I can only imagine how much harder it is for them because um, technology plays a different role. I get it, right? Which I think is what actually motivates so much of what I write, because I'm writing to myself, <laughs> right? Because I struggle with it. Along those lines, at what point, somebody has written and asked, at what point should your child have a cell phone, and how do you teach them to use that wisely? <laughs> um, I shy away from giving ages kind of markers. Um, I also shy away from kind of rules, guidelines for parents, because I actually think Every family is really different. Um, every child is really different in our families, right? Um, and so I think um, those are hard conversations we need to have with in our families. And, and I mean them as conversations, not like parent telling child this is how it's going to be. Sorry, parents. Um, <laughs> but, but conversations, like, hey, um, I see this happening. Um, I'm not so sure this is so great. You know, you've been on the screen for four hours since you've come home from school. And there's a lot of other things I know you love to do. Um, and I get that maybe you're bored. Um, hey, let's talk about what else we can be doing and how can I help you find those things, right? Um, and how can we set some parameters and say, hey, let's just do this for an hour. And let's just try, what if it's just an hour? and let's check back in like two weeks from now and just let's see how that is, right? You mentioned boredom and in your book you cite Sherry Turkle who talks about really the, the positive aspects of, mm -hmm. of boredom, mm -hmm. um, that, that they give us time for reflection and yeah. she talks about then they help you, times of boredom and reflection help you construct the narratives that help shape your identity. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's so fascinating to think of boredom as something that actually has function, <laughs> right? Because um, we think it's just a waste. We think it's just, you know, useless. Um, but if we actually accept boredom instead of resisting it, um, I think that's, that's the shift in orientation that we can try experimenting with right, um, and, and find out what could actually happen. But it is, it is an interesting correlation um, to think about the rise of technology um, and the diminishment of boredom and also the diminishment of empathy, the diminishment, right, of capacity to construct really whole self-narratives that we see in society, um, those correlations, I think, are, are worth probing mm -hmm. and, and pondering. So from a colleague, what is your view of research on the ties between tech and teen mental health? What practices will help our young people, Eve? 
partly answered that, I think, but... Yeah, you know, saying. I mean, I think... I'm really interested in what kind of research is going to come out in the next 10 years, because we've really, in some ways, have been waiting, I feel like. We've been waiting for time to go by and data to start getting gathered um, so that the research can start really developing um, in a sure way. Um, I think the trick will be to, um, if, if there's a way to, research is always so complicated this way, is, is the studies are done differently, they're designed differently, so the variables don't line up, right? Um, but I think when it comes to teen mental health, and I would even argue adult mental health, I mean, it's just, it's, it's not good, right, in a severe way. And I think it's interesting that um, the public school systems are recognizing that um, in an increasing way, right? Private schools have been recognizing it already, but public schools are starting to see that, um, you know, having the smartphones in class aren't, aren't productive um, for learning, and so I think it is trying to, I think the research is fascinating, translating it down into how we organize school, family life, organizational life is going to be the trick. Sure. What do you think of apps for Christian meditation and <laughs> devotion? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I think it's such a great question. Um, all my instincts say no. <laughs> um, it's like, um, you know, it's, it's an ironic sort of use of technology. But I'll tell you this story. Um, so, um, Lexio Divina, right? This practice of, of praying the scripture. Um, this is a practice that's relatively new for me in my Christian practice. And um, I've always struggled with it because I understood that you're supposed to read scripture and pray with it rather than analyze it. But because I've spent too many years in graduate school, my brain can't stop analyzing it, right? And so I find Lexio Divina to be exceptionally difficult practice. I can't quiet the analytical brain. And so I tried a Lexio Divina app, which I would listen to someone reading the scripture and guiding me through the prayer. And something about not reading the words, but listening to them actually kind of somehow hops over my analytical brain and I can pray it more, right? So, you know, I still think they're really ironic, right? The Christian apps, the Bible, all that stuff. But I also know that there are really interesting functions and applications for, especially for those of us that just kind of have hang-ups. Well, and it's right. interesting, too, you mentioned that, because my experience with Lexio Divino is that it's been successful when I've been able to do it with other people in okay, a room. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, a step, because, again, it's about hearing the voice and right. feeling the presence of others. Yeah. Uh, but if you can't do that, maybe the app is the next best thing. Right. Several questions coming in about how technology might be part of solutions mm -hmm. to our addiction to technology, um, yeah. including a student who remembers playing a video game that would periodically remind the user yeah. to take breaks. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think there's so many um, helpful benefits of our various devices. Um, and so I think the trick is how it is that we live our lives in a way that doesn't um, become mastered by them. Um, and, so that's kind of a secular liturgy move, like don't be mastered by the secular liturgy. But I'm also, I wanna kind of push back and, with the counter liturgy move and say, I actually think that um, one of the things that is lost in the pace and the demands of our digital is the space, and this gets back to boredom in some ways, um, or our conversation about boredom, um, the space and permission to develop an interior life, 
um, we don't live lives, and, and this isn't just about technology. A lot of us just don't live, like contemporary life is not structured um, to let us um, develop interior lives. We are, we're highly scheduled. We are all about productivity, right? All those things do not help us value solitude. They do not help us value stillness. They do not help us value um, quietness, right? Because all of those things seem fruitless in a productive, productivity-oriented society. Um, and so I think it's fine to adopt those texts. And, and yes, many of us might have certain situations where the tech is really important to help us manage, yes. But at the same time, that doesn't preclude us from building up right, practices that help us ground some interior space, some interior life that then can hold right, fast when we are using all those technologies. The differences between being a user of technology and being used by technology, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, it, one of my students pointed out this morning that we use we employ the term user to describe drug addicts yep. and internet users. Yep. That was a startling realization. There's a reason mm -hmm. why it's yeah. user. <laughs> so addictive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, in fact, this uh, audience member says, I often think of cell phones as pocket idols or addictions. How do we resist? their minute-by-minute minute intrusion into our daily lives while we carry them so close to our bodies and hearts, like an alcoholic who's trying to stay dry while always carrying a fifth of whiskey in their <laughs> pocket. I think there's an answer implied in the question. <laughs> Put it in the other room. <laughs> you know, I think what's, what is interesting is, um, you know when you get a new app, you download it, and the defaults are set so that it takes over, mm -hmm. right? Notifications, everything, taking all your data, right? It's set, and you have to do a lot of work to make it stop doing those things, right? First, you have to remember, oh, I need to go in and do all those things. It's not gonna remind you, hey, do you wanna do, you know, do you wanna de you know, toggle over all those things? Um, but that's what we all need to be doing, basically, right? Is to say, well, I'm shutting off my notifications, I'm setting these timers, that's like, I'm not, you know, like, the, we have... We takes, do have choices. We do have choices, but I want to acknowledge it takes a lot of work mm -hmm. and intention. And again, there's, that's, not by, that's not an accident, right? It's by design. So it takes a lot of work, which is why the communal help is so essential, right? It's so hard when we're the only one. But right, when we can do it together and we just make it into a norm in our community that, hey, let's all remember to do this, right? Or um, have it even be a part of our conversations, that helps us. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel as much of a uphill battle. I do like that idea of thinking communally about how to use whatever platforms we're using mm -hmm. and having agreements about that. What made you want to talk about this topic, asks a viewer. Um, well, so I've been thinking about media and technology for a long time. Um, I started um, my questions about media um, way back in the 90s. Um, when I read a book by Neil Postman, Amusing Ourselves to Death, that many of you might have read before. Um, and I just was really fascinated by this idea that um, what, what shapes our human experience is not so much the content of a technology, but the form, right? That there's something about the design and the ways that we use it that like, shapes identity and friendship and relationship. Um, and in the end of the day, what I am interested in as a sociologist is how is it that when I'm a friend to someone now in 2024, it's really different from what being a friend looked like in 1960 and what it looked like in 1910, right? It's all friendship. It's the same thing, 
but it's not at all, right? And, and so, like, how, what changed? What, how did it become something so different is what I'm ultimately interested in. Um, but I, I'm interested in the variable of technology in that. Like, how has technology played a role in how our sense of identity, community, relationship has shifted? Um, and so I found myself here. Very good. I'm, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here, here. <laughs> Thank you for your time and your thoughts. The book is excellent and um, gives us lots to think about. Thank you. Um, Thank you for your time. Thank you all for your good questions and for being with us this week. Next week, we'll hear more about technology. And so keep these thoughts in your minds. And thank you very much. Have a good weekend. Thank you to our underwriters, the Howard, Howard Miller Company today. Thank you all again.